Hi, this is the Bet Central Podcast. Let's make some profit. Hello and welcome to the Bed Central Podcast, powered by Bed Coza. I'm your host, Mitch McKenna. We're back for yet another week of Premier League action. Now, things are heating up as Grant and I are going to take you through a full round of fixtures this weekend. Grant, it all kicks off Newcastle taking on Tottenham this weekend. Now, of course, Tottenham are in the running for top four, so every three point really does count. We know how the Geordies are at St. James's Park. But I feel like this game might be, you know, a goal fest from both sides with Tottenham playing that high line. Yeah, this feels like a game where we're going to see goals uh, because Newcastle are pretty ravaged at the back. They've got, you know, their, their goalkeepers out, their top centre back, Sven Botman. They're missing a lot of fullbacks. Um, and obviously, Spurs are quite an attacking team who also leak a lot of goals. I think it's 20 in, I think, 20 of the last 23 matches they've conceded. And this fixture, you know, also tends to have goals. I mean, the last six games between, you know, between these teams in this fixture have seen 31 goals. You know, just the last two meetings, we've seen a 4-1 win at, um, at home for Spurs and a 6-1 win at home for Newcastle. So, I mean, it does feel like these teams will definitely both concede, but probably have enough to, you know, to both score. Um, so, yeah, I definitely back the goals markets as the best value. But I think the, the bookies are kind of wise to that because if you look at over 3.5 goals, it's, it's only at 1.86. So that's decent. But I mean, usually we're getting you know over two, two point something for that. So that's probably still my best bet. But I don't think the odds are as tempting as maybe I, you know, I thought before. And if I had to actually go for a winner, I'd probably lean towards Spurs because they, I think with all their firepower and all their bench options, I think they could really hurt Newcastle. And yes, Newcastle won at Fulham last week, but they had to play quite defensively to do it. They only had about a third of the ball and they scored late and they didn't really create a whole lot. Whereas I think Spurs are playing with a lot more confidence in Fulham, who seems to be on holiday already. So I think I lean more towards Spurs and there's a lot of motivation now because it looks like slightly less likely that fifth spot will be the Champions League spot, the way the English teams have done in Europe this week. So that makes there's more incentive for Spurs to finish in the in the top four and they're only ahead of Villa on goal difference, but Villa play Arsenal. So it's a big weekend for Spurs and I think they might have a little bit more going for them and actually take the victory in this one if I had to pick, but I'd probably stay with the goals market as my best bet. Now we've got Man City taking on Luton on Saturday as well. I mean, look, it's always been a theme for us when we've been doing this podcast, trying to find value in a Manchester City game is really difficult. Plus, I mean, you're, you're expecting some sort of rotation with the Real Madrid game coming this upcoming Wednesday. So Kevin De Bruyne didn't play in midweek, but I'm pretty sure they'll give him a run against Luton. Um, yeah, so I'm assuming it's, it's a case of you wait to see what the starting lineup is, and then you react toward that, right? Yeah, it has to be, I think, because Pep's surely going to rotate. Um, obviously, the, the tie against your boys is, is pr- quite precariously balanced. Um, and you mentioned De Bruyne got no minutes in, the, in midweek, neither did Jeremy Doku. I think, you know, Guardiola tends to go for the safer players in the big games who don't uh, sort of put the ball up for grabs. And obviously, Doku's dribbling and De Bruyne's killer passes can do that. So I think he went with the safer options in, you know, against you guys in midweek. Um, so you'd expect them both to start. Even if they're going to start the second leg, you know, they need to play here. They can't have no minutes again or just a short sub run out. So I think those are two players to look at in the goals market. Um, and yes, getting value is really hard because City are 1.1 1. 1 to, to win this fixture. And Luton are, you know, they obviously they fight really hard. They got a great victory against Bournemouth last time. And they've scored more goals than Man United this season. And they, they're only outside the, the relegation zone on goal difference. So they have every chance of staying up. I just, you know, in this game, they're probably going to get beaten by a few goals. Although that doesn't happen a lot, even against the top teams. They often lose by just one or two goals. Um, so there's a slight concern that maybe City will get 2-0 up and then kind of take the fill off the gas, just keep the ball and and conserve energy. And so, yeah, it, is quite, it makes it quite a difficult game to bet on. I think I'll look at the lineups. You know, maybe if Alvarez is playing as a nine, I'd look at him possibly to score De Bruyne and Docu options. Um, yeah, or just you have to back City on the, on the handicap to get anything. I mean, you can start to get some value at Man City minus two if they win by three goals, and that's 1.8. So, yeah, it's not an easy game. It's not very tempting to find, uh, you know, a lot of bets in this one. This might be one just to just to kind of cast aside because of the risks involved. 
And then we've got Forest will be playing host to Wolves, obviously with everything going down towards the bottom of the table with deducted points. Three points are crucial for those five teams at the bottom. Um, I think, look, Forest, on the other hand, can get a teams they can score. I am leaning towards maybe going for a solid punt of a Chris Wood anytime goal scorer because there's no better striker than relegation Chris Wood. He always steps up, he does the job, and he's been scoring in, in recent weeks. So, yeah, that's who I'm leaning towards, maybe for an anytime goal scorer against Wolves. Yeah, Wolves are hard at the moment to even bet on as well because of the injuries. I mean, last week, out, you know, last time out they played West Ham and they lost at home. Uh, yeah, they conceded some weird goals, you know, Ward Prowse scored from directly from a corner and all this stuff, but, and a penalty. But if you look at their lineup, I mean, it was like, you know, Sarabia was up front and then pretty much the most attacking player on the pitch besides him was, you know, was Ait Nouri, who was kind of playing in like the front three. Um, Matt Doherty was playing in, the usual, in his usual wing back role, you know, in um, Ait Nouri's usual wing back role. And yes, you know, Kunya's back on the bench and they've got a couple of young players, but they look a bit short in attack. Um, so it's difficult to back them because even if they play well, they're just not going to put the ball in the net. And Forrest are desperate. They've got some good results lately. And I think the Chris Wood tip is, is quite a nice one. He's, he's turned out to be a really good signing for them. Um, yeah, and if you look at the kind of the the records, I mean, okay, Wolves do have a good record against Forrest, but maybe that's maybe that means it could be a draw. I mean, that's also possible in this one. I mean, Wolves have only lost once in their last 12 games against Forrest across all competitions. And the last three meetings have been draws. So it's quite a tough one. I definitely wouldn't back Wolves to win. Um, so I'd maybe, maybe I'd lean toward a draw or I'd look at maybe the double chance market. You know, I fancy Forest, but I'm a bit concerned they don't take the three points. So if you go for double chance on Forest and then maybe add some sort of goals into that. Um, so if you go maybe Forest or draw double chance and even over 1.5 goals can get you 1.66 in a multiple slip. That's kind of a nice safe-ish bet. Um, it kind of covers a 1-1 draw or if, if Forrest do get the win and both teams are scored and you also set. So I probably would go for that, you know, kind of fall on that as the best um, the best bet. Now let's go on over to Brentford, who will be playing host to Sheffield United. I, f- I have a feeling this is going to be the game where we finally get to see Ivan Tony, Mbwemo and Vissa probably start together this season. We saw Tony um, get benched last week. Of course, Mbwemo stepped up and he did the business. Um, I think that's always been the issue for Thomas Frank, not having all three of those players available to play. But I mean, against Sheffield United, who've been struggling this season, I have a feeling we might even see that he might be more attacking than his uh, back five, his pragmatic style that he usually sets up. Mm. Yeah, I mean, look, based on what we say every week, that, that is likely. Against the teams he can beat, he usually plays more and more attacking style. And he will surely fancy beating Sheffield United. Most teams do, unless you're Chelsea. So I think Brentford, if they play that front three and they take actually take the game to the Blades, then you'd expect him to score a few goals. I mean, Brentford scored three at Villa last week. And they can see they create a lot of a lot of chances against Man United a couple of games before that. Um, so, and you know, they, they have got firepower, but they haven't really got defensive solidity. So if they want to win, they probably have to throw caution to the wind and out, just outscore their opponents. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, Sheffield United fought hard against Chelsea to get that point and played quite direct and stayed in the game nicely. But, yeah, there was nothing to really suggest they, they're about to go on a sort of run that keeps them in the, you know, within hope of staying in the league. I think so. I think Brentford will probably win. And I mean, 1.41 maybe isn't amazing odds, but that's not terrible against the bottom place club. Um, so that could be one to look at. Or I think you could back Brentford on the handicap. I think they could win by two goals in this game. And that's 2.1. And then if you do see the lineups and Tony's back in, then you'd expect him to have to be fresh firstly after a bit of a breather and to have a bit of a point to prove. So he's 2.05 to score any time. So, I mean, those are the ways to look at it. Um, yes, Tony's an aerial striker. And that's one thing Sheffield United can do is kind of, you know, do well in the air. But I think he'll be, yeah, he'll be too smart for them with his touch and, or, and whatnot to actually keep him quiet. So, yeah, Tony, anytime scorer or Brentford minus one is, is how I'm going to go, yeah, against the bottom place team. And then we go to Turf Mall, Burnley, playing Brighton. Um, yeah, it's like, uh, with Brighton, it, they show up and down, and you just never know. I think for me, I'll probably be back in goals market. I can see both teams scoring. Uh, but I want to see that Brighton lineup uh, to see, because I might just take a risk 
and go with like a Danny Waldbeck anytime goal scorer because he definitely shows up. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Maybe both teams to score. I can see that happening. Mm. Yeah, look, Brighton are weird at the moment. They're not really playing that well um, against Arsenal. They, they lost 3-0. They had quite a good start and then Arsenal controlled the game. And then in the second half, Brighton were kind of allowed to have loads of possession. They didn't really have the answers to break down Arsenal. And Arsenal are, you know, the best defensive team in the league, probably. Um, so that's not the end of the world. But I mean, I have to see a Brighton just a bit hard to put your finger on at the moment. And as you say, with their lineups, it changes wildly from game to game. You know, they... You see the whole front four kind of change between one match to the next. He changes the midfield a lot, even though they, you know, they're not in Europe anymore. He should be surely trying to find some consistency and, and put his, put a run together. Um, and yeah, Burnley have had a little bit of an uptick in form. Um, Vincent Company's not going to be on the bench. You know, he's, he's serving a suspension. But yeah, I mean, I think Burnley are playing decently again. They it's always like they're kind of with the relegation teams that they can have a little late season flourish. Yeah, they lost at Everton, but they had 10 men in that game for basically the whole match. Um, so you can't really necessarily you know, judge them too harsh for that one. Um, it's not an easy match, actually, because, yeah, look, Brighton have smashed teams like Burnley 4-5-0 no, when they're actually on it. But there have been a lot of inconsistent performances, and Brighton aren't, aren't the best on the road. The Most of their top results come at the Amex. So I'm a bit worried about this game um, in terms of picking one or the other. You mentioned Walbeck. I think... If he's playing or Jao Pedro is playing, because Jao Pedro is not back from injury, and I mean, I like him a lot. I think they could be worth backing. Or possibly Dr. Fofana, because he's he's got four Premier League goals. Brighton will give him some space, and he's got a lot of kind of power, and he could, you know, might cause him some issues. So I'd maybe look at the scorer markets, because they're around 2, 2, 2.3, 2.5, somewhere on there, or even better for Walbeck at 3.3, uh, because I'm just not sure on Brighton, to be, you know, to be honest. Even both teams have scored 1.51. I mean, that seems yet a bit safer, and I'm probably yeah. more inclined to go the low odds for the most for the greater safety. And then we wrap Saturday up with Bournemouth playing Manchester United. United, yeah, <laughs> also up and down recently. I mean, good performance against Liverpool. Uh, they are. I mean, they're still chasing top six. I mean, top uh, yeah, top six and, and top four. I think with uh, with Spurs' is running where they still have to play Arsenal, still have to play uh, Liverpool and Man City, I think that might be difficult. Also, Villa's also got a difficult run. So if you're United, you might just have an outside chance, but it's important to collect three points. Bournemouth, not going to be easy side. Um, Dominique Solanke hasn't scored in two games, if I'm not mistaken, but this is certainly a game that he could find himself in the scoring sheet with the amount of shots that Manchester United face. It's actually crazy. Yeah, I mean, United, I mean, yes, they got a point against Liverpool, but the first half, they were nowhere. They barely had a shot. They conceded loads of chances. Again, I think Liverpool, on a more ruthless day, would have killed that off. But for whatever reason, United just managed to hold on in those games against their rivals. Um, they've yeah. So look, in the end, they got their two-two draw. I've quite a lot of fortune involved. I mean, the, against Bournemouth in the first meeting, they lost three 0 at Old Trafford. Bournemouth really enjoyed all the space afforded to them because um, they are a good footballing team, and United are quite fun to play against because yeah, they have a lot of attacking talent. Gonacho obviously playing brilliantly, but you're going to get a lot of space to enjoy yourself. And yeah, I mean. I, I mean, in a lot of these games, I fancy the opponents against United, they, and they tend to somehow surprise me and get, you know, get results even when they don't, when they haven't been the better team on the day. But I kind of fancy Bournemouth to win. I mean, yes, they've they've maybe been a, a bit more goal shy of late. You know, you mentioned you mentioned Solanke not scoring, but they scored one against Palace and only one against Luton, and then they beat Everton before that. But yeah, their goals have dried up slightly since that comeback against Luton that four three. But I just I kind of fancy Bournemouth to do something. Yeah, it's such a free hit for them and. All they really have to do is just stay relatively tight and wait for the United spaces to open up because there's so much space around Casemiro and and you know Manu is a great player but you know he's can't do Casemiro's running as well so yeah I mean I kind of fancy Bournemouth to do something in the game um, with with their crowd behind them United yeah you say have a small chance of a Champions League spot but I think it's quite remote um, so I think I think they could just be off it again I mean. They've conceded tw- uh, tw- what, 25 shots per game or whatever over the last dozen games. I can't see them having a game where they like you know concede 10 shots, defend well, and beat Bournemouth one or two. No, I think they will give up chances. So it's just whether you know the cherries are are ruthless. So Bournemouth the 2.4. I mean, I like that as a as a straight bet. 
Or I'd maybe look at Bournemouth double chance and then add in some goals because you you would surely bet on their banking, you know, bank on their being goals in this game. Yeah. Bournemouth double chance and over 2.5, that's 2.3. That could be quite tempting for me because this could be, um, it could be a 3-2 either way or, you know, sorry, a 3-2 for Bournemouth or a draw, maybe a 2-2 draw. I just fancy them, so I might, I might look at that market. And then we move on over to Sunday. West Ham taking on Fulham. Um, yeah, again, both teams that are up and down. It's it's yo-yo. You don't know what you can expect from both these guys. But in terms of transition, uh, teams that can hit you on the break, uh, Kudus, uh, Paqueta, and also Jared Bowen have been stars of the show, especially for West Ham. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I might, I might just skip this one, Grant, if I'm being honest with you. Or am I just wait to see starting lineups again? Because I'm still, yeah, I'm not too sure. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen here because Fulham are awful travellers and they also look like they you know, now might be kind of on the beach. They lost at home last week when I thought they'd actually you know, rally themselves and do something on, on their home turf like they usually do. And then you have West Ham who lost by Leverkusen last night. They had one shot in the entire match, 27% possession and conceded 33 shots. Uh, it was complete one-way traffic. In the end, Lena Leverkusen got the, the goals they needed. It took them until the 83rd minute. West Ham, I mean, Moyes would have, if he'd left with a nil-nil draw, you know, it would have been like a, considered a masterclass. But when you do end up losing 2-0 and now you you probably have one foot out of the competition, it looks like a poor decision. And then Jared Bowen missed that game completely with injury. So that's a big factor as well. Um, you know, if he's out there... Yeah, it just makes a big difference. Antonio is still feeling his way back in and it's, they miss him a lot. So I really can't pick which way it's going to go. I mean, I wouldn't back Fulham to win on the road because they just hardly ever do and, you know, they're not really focused. Uh, so maybe a draw. I mean, that's probably the way I kind of go about it, but it's not an easy game. I mean, I think your idea to just maybe stay away makes more sense or maybe look at the in-running market. Maybe West Ham are kind of up for it and Fulham are just, you can see that they're just not there and you can back in-running back West Ham. But otherwise, maybe like pre-game, stay away from it. West Ham also play in the Europa League in you know, the second league in a few days. So there's just too many factors to make this any sort of surety in this game. Yeah, I mean, yeah, West Ham, yeah, it's just one of those sides where, I mean, you, you want the best for them, but yeah, you just never know what they're going to do. Now, let's jump into, obviously, a big game this weekend, Arsenal taking on Villa. Um, yeah, in terms of title race, Arsenal currently sitting on top, but uh, the, the villains could definitely step up. And imagine Unai Emery being the reason that spoils the Arsenal party. That would be hilarious. What's your thoughts on this game, Grant? Yeah, it's a really nice fixture. It's yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one for Arsenal. They, of course, also between Champions League ties at the moment. Um, Aston Villa, but you know, in between Europe, um, Europa Conference League t- a tie against Lille, which they won two one last night. Um, which, yeah, but they they were two 0 up and they conceded quite late. So that's I think that's meant that their focus has to be slightly more on the second leg. A two 0 win would have been pretty nice result and given them a lot more, yeah, just a lot more surety going to the second leg. Now they they will be distracted. Um, Arsenal will be distracted by Bayern, but I mean they still have a title to to win as well. So yeah, it's a weird game. Both teams are kind of split in their focus. It's not going to be an easy one to call. I mean Aston Villa won the reverse fixture. Arsenal one of Arsenal's worst performances of the season. Uh, yeah, also not an easy one to bet on. I mean look, I've, I watched almost all Arsenal's games, and I they're a really good team. I'm sure they'll bounce back in this game and win because yeah. they, they need to. They have to. Um, but that's not going to be easy. I mean, if they do, it's probably going to be about one goal. It's probably going to be similar to uh, some of their recent fixtures where they, they kind of get in front and then kind of close up shop, absorb pressure, and then take the win that way. They're very good at that now. Uh, they might even have to do that against Bayern away, maybe try and nick the first goal and then just sit back and yeah, yeah. use this kind of new defensive uh, solidity. So, yeah, I'd probably go for Arsenal. But, I mean, to get value, maybe Arsenal by one goal could be the way to go. I mean, the odds are huge on get Arsenal to win by exactly one goal. That's 3.85. I mean, that's quite high high risk, but, you know, that's going to be a nice reward for you. The score of Marcus I'm a bit concerned by because I'm not sure how they they might change it up a bit. I mean, you think Trossard yeah. and Gabriel could come in. Yeah. You might make a few other rotations. So, yeah, Arsenal by one goal might be my top bet because uh, they're 1.27, I mean, straight win against Villa, which is kind of crazy. Villa, you know, in the top four race. So those odds aren't generous enough. So I think you'd have to go for something riskier. And yeah, so 
Awesome by one goal is probably the way I'm going to go for to get that value. Now let's move on over to Liverpool. They lost in the Europa League at home to Atalanta 3-0. They take on Crystal Palace as they turn their focus to the Premier League. Uh, I think what, what we've noticed is also when teams play is also key because by the time Liverpool or Arsenal play, if City would have beat Luton, City's on job. So, I mean, that adds more pressure as well because you always want to get at least those three points above your rivals. And then in the back of their minds, they're also thinking about Europa next week, which where they need to score four goals just to go through to the next round. They are boosted by the fact that they are returning players, Jota, uh, Trent. So that's a good thing. But still, I mean, there's a lot of factors going into this Liverpool side. And I do see Liverpool maybe beating Crystal Palace. Yeah, I think Liverpool will bounce back and win. I mean, yes, and last night they were just completely off their game. I mean, they played a strong team. It wasn't like they rested a lot of players. They had Konate back, you know, after Kwanzaa had a, some tough moments against Man United. But it was it was a pretty strong team. Yes, maybe, you know, Salah was left out. But to, to lose 3 not at home was really surprising, especially because they gave up seven big chances in the game. And Atlanta missed five of those. So, I mean, they Liverpool were really exposed defensively. Um, and just went, yeah, they just went, on, just went on it. I mean, maybe some complacency or focus on the league race or whatever it might be. Yeah. Just, you know, too many changes in, in their side. Even though it was a strong team, there was quite a few changes and just in general. And um, maybe it just disrupted them. So, I mean, yeah, they need to get straight back on it. Of course, at home, they hardly ever lose in the league. They've got a great record. Palace are a nice team to play at the moment because they, yes, they're very defensive. Um but they, they're not in really in great form since they changed coach. Um, they lost away at Bournemouth. They lost 4-2 to Man City last week with almost none of the ball. And they've had games where they've created nothing. So it's probably nice for Liverpool to play a team with slightly less attacking threats after kind of a few leaky performances. Maybe just to get, you know, be a bit more solid and get back on track defensively. And then Palace have all these injuries as well that are still affecting them. You know, Sheikh Dekure out for the season, Mark Gohi out. Um, even yeah. Chris Richards, who was covering for Gohi, is, is out as well. Um, Michael Elise, I think, is sort of back on the comeback trail. So that's that's something. But I think Liverpool win, and I think I lean more towards him winning to zero because of Palace's back five and not creating a whole lot, and Liverpool needing kind of a clean sheet to a bit of a palate cleanser, kind you know, kind of in the game um, to yeah, just to make up for some of their results recently. So Liverpool win to zero gives you two point one. I think that's good. That gives you enough value to actually back that. Um, usually I back Salah in the scorer markets, but he's been he's been really off the boil, you know, off the boil in the last few games, uh, in performances and in terms of scoring. Besides a penalty, so I'm not even that sure on him. Uh, even the other guys aren't that good in terms of the scoring markets. You know, Darwin Nunes in one point nine five. So I think I'll just go for Liverpool win to no one and just hope that they defend properly in this game. Um, that's my best bet, I think. Now, let's move on over to your beloved Chelsea taking on Everton this weekend. Again, Everton find themselves towards the bottom of the table because of points deduction. Chelsea, <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those seasons where you just don't know what, what to expect, what Chelsea will show up on the day. What do you make of this one playing at the bridge? It's Everton. I mean, you expect three points, but yeah, I'm not too sure. Mm, yeah, and Chelsea are just so difficult to bet on. If you look at like the record, the last eleven games, only one defeat. You know, so there's a, there's a kind of an unbeaten streak going there. Besides the you know the Carabao Cup final, and even then that was you know level after ninety minutes. So I mean, teams aren't beating Chelsea all the time, but they they just can't. We're just conceding goals for fun at the moment. I mean, the defensive record is pretty pathetic. I mean, it's like. No clean sheet in the last 13-odd games. 27 goals leaked in that time. So every game, the Blues are conceding two goals. They've tried to face Thiago Silva out, and they've kind of the other players haven't stepped up. When he's come back in, the team's still leaking goals. Um, and Everton will be a tough nut to crack because they're not going to care about possession, and they could come and play for a draw and, and probably have enough to get it the way Chelsea are playing. I mean, last time out, Everton ended that 13-match winless run in the league which was a huge yeah. result for them. Yes, they beat Burnley, who had 10 men, but they wouldn't care. I mean, they've they got the result they needed. I mean, the one slight worry as I look to Everton's team news, you know, Dominic Cavalier missed training on Thursday and, and Sean Dyche is kind of, is a bit cagey on whether he's going to play. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, they have got some players coming back though, you know, Amadou Ananas back, Idrissa Gay is back from um, family kind of leave. 
um, Danjuma's back to give them some more some more options. So if Kavaluan's fit and those guys all come back, then they're in pretty good shape. They, then I'll, I might kind of be tempted to back, you know, Everton on the double chance. I just just back Chelsea not to win at the moment is actually often a good way to go. Um, yeah, and if you are confident in Chelsea doing something, you know, I'd back maybe Palmer to score because he was off the boil against Sheffield United, but he was a little he was a bit tired after some of his recent exertions. So you could go for Palmer to score and get his twentieth goal of the season. There's also the chance of a penalty again. Chelsea get tons of penalties, so that's that's probably the way to go. One one point eight for Palmer to score any time, or four point two yeah. to be the first goal scorer. You could see it being tight, and he breaks the deadlock. Four point two is huge odds. There's no one else at back in the scoring market. Jackson's gone slightly off the boil of late. So yeah, it's a tough one um, to find anything. I mean, just Villa double chance could. I mean, sorry, Everton double chance could be the way to go. Two point two five, and just you kind of bet, kind of backing against Chelsea to win instead of necessarily thinking you feel Everton will do something. Uh, that's probably the way I'd go in this in this final fixture. Well, there we go. That's the full round of fixtures this weekend. Let us know how you'll be betting by simply tagging us at Bedcoza. We will see you again, myself and Grant and Dave. We'll be back next week to give you those second legs uh, of the Champions League. So make sure you don't miss out on that. I've been Mitch Matjana. That's been Grant. We'll see you again. Peace. Peace.